Hi, I'm Pam Jocelyn, and I'm an Albert Einstein Fellow with the Naval STEM Coordination Office out of the Office of Naval Research. And today I would like to welcome Jason Cooey. And Jason, could you tell us what is your role and your title, please? I am a research physicist at the Washington, D.C. location of the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory. And in particular, I work within the Remote Sensing Division. And the idea behind our division is we use remote sensing techniques to better understand environments that we can't just send scientists into. So it's hard to send a scientist into the depths of the ocean, into the heights of the atmosphere, and out into deep space. So we use these remote measurements to better understand those environments. And myself in particular, I borrow techniques from uh, radio astronomy and apply those to the Sun-Earth space environment. Nice. That's really cool. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what did you study to, to get to where you are today? Primarily math and physics. So when I was a kid, most of my role models were scientists of one kind or another. So I idolized Dr. Egon Spangler from the Ghostbusters, scientist. I idolized Donatello from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, scientist. And even my first martial arts teacher was a scientist slash engineer. So I knew I want to be a scientist. And so growing up, middle school, high school, I would ask people, how do you become a scientist? And I got variations on the theme of you should study and see if you can get good at math. And if you don't really know what kind of science you want to do, try physics, because then you'll get a flavor for everything. And so that led me eventually to college at the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology, or New Mexico Tech, where I pursued bachelors in physics and math. And I stayed for a math analysis degree, because I just thought math was just so much fun, so might as well sneak that in there uh, before going to the University of Iowa where I completed my PhD in physics in 2016. So how did you get to the Navy then? So I found my way to DON actually uh, through conferences. So one of the most important skills that a, a scientist can develop really is being able to communicate your science not only to other scientists but to the general public. Otherwise, no matter how good your science is, if no one understands it, you can't really get it out there. And so uh, one of the ways we train this, of course, is by going to conferences, talking about our research. And at one of the conferences I attended as a graduate student, uh, there were several people from the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory also in attendance. And so after exchanging a number of emails, um, and after they saw my presentation and got a feel for my sort of overall view on sort of studying space weather with radio observations, they realized that I would be a good fit for their group. So I came aboard shortly after my PhD uh, through the Naval Research Laboratory's CARL's fellowship program. Could you describe your science and technology in more depth? Certainly will. So our area is sort of generally called space weather. And that's kind of a catch-all term for studying the environment and environmental effects uh, in space, uh, notably in and around the Earth space environment. And so just like Earth has its own unique weather system, space has a weather system effectively. The sun generates a solar wind that just permeates the entire solar system and beyond. And just like the wind at Earth, this solar wind comes in many different varieties. There's fast solar winds uh, that propagate at speeds of about 800 kilometers per second, so really fast yeah. for our uh, terrestrial speeds. Um, there's also a slow solar wind that's about half that speed. And all of these winds coming from the sun they're comprised of charged particles, electrons, protons, and other ions, uh, forming a plasma. 
And one of the unique things about the environment is it has, again, these different types of weather associated. So if you have like the fast wind overtake that slow wind, uh, it creates a sort of pile up of these particles, just like say a wave in the ocean. And just mm -hmm. like waves can buffet against ships regularly, uh, these so-called stream interaction regions buffet the earth on a regular basis. However, the most spectacular phenomena are coronal mass ejections. These are huge eruptions of these charged particles that emanate from the sun. So big, in fact, they have their own magnetic field associated with them. So one of the ways we observe these things is in white light imaging. So if you look at, for instance, coronagraph images off of spacecraft, and coronagraphs are basically instruments that generate a, uh, their own unique solar eclipse, so we can study the solar wind around the sun. Uh, in these images, you'll see the constantly streaming solar wind. You'll see background stars slowly march across the screen. You'll notice these quick, rapid eruptions from the sun, just these big bursts coming out at all angles from the sun. And uh, these bursts, these coronal mass ejections, are what we're most interested in. To wit, the reason we're most interested in these is when one of these impacts the Earth, it causes what's called a geomagnetic storm. And these geomagnetic storms you can think of as extreme weather events. Just like Earth has tornadoes and hurricanes that are categorized by their power and intensity, uh, we also in space have these extreme weather events, these geomagnetic storms that we can categorize. I have a question. When you see those geomagnetic storms, how do we, can we observe them? Are they like the aurora borealis or, or is, it, is it something that we can physically see? Indeed. So every time you get uh, an aurora notice that today you can see the aurora, aurora borealis or the aurora, aurora australis, there we go. Um, every time you get an aurora notice, that is from a geomagnetic storm. So sometimes these things generate just beautiful displays on the sky. However, it's the other impacts they have that are, the Navy is concerned with. So where, where would I get to see an aurora at, or, or how would I get to see an aurora? So if you're thinking of, you know, tourist destinations, well, you have to go to the, the highest northern latitudes or the lowest southern latitudes. Uh, in particular, if you want to go down, Antarctica is a good place to see these. If you want to go real far north, the North Pole, uh, but even, you know, going to places like Greenland or some of the northern European countries, uh, Canada can see these a lot of times. And even, especially for moderate to strong geomagnetic storms, we'll get uh, aurora that comes down into the northernmost United States. So there are actually networks online where you can sign up and they will alert you, hey, aurora tonight, hope it's not cloudy. And you can go outside and hopefully, you know, see some faint aurora here in the United States or everywhere else in the world. So then tell us about that. Could you tell us how that's relevant to the Navy? Certainly would love to. So when one of these coronal mass ejections hits the Earth, remember this causes a geomagnetic storm. And these geomagnetic storm can cause beautiful sky displays like aurora. They can impact Navy communication systems, radar systems, location systems. They can cause GPS errors by factors of 10 or 100. Wow. They can knock out your internet. So if we step back in time, uh, one of the, the, the greatest known geomagnetic storm events was the so-called Carrington event in 1859. And when that geomagnetic storm occurred, you could see aurora easily during daytime hours, and at night you could see it all the way down to the equator. That's how, that's how strong it was. It even induced massive currents in what we had at the time, which was the telegraph system. So this not only shorted some telegraphs, set fire to some operational telegraph booths, wow. 
uh, but it, uh, the currents actually powered telegraph communication for a couple hours without requiring any additional power. So people could communicate easily enough as if the telegraph system was powered just because of the currents induced in the system. Those same currents today uh, can devastate our electric grid. And indeed, in 1989, uh, they did induce high currents in the Hydro-Quebec power system, and that caused a blackout up in Canada for uh, over nine hours, basically. So you can, if you take something like that Carrington event and extrapolate to what it would be like in our technological society, you know, not only is this of importance to the, the Navy, but it's also very important for civilian infrastructure as well. In the case of space weather, the cutting edge technology basically is uh, detecting these things when they're only a couple hours out from Earth. So about one and a half million kilometers from Earth, we have a number of satellites that can uh, detect the properties of coronal mass ejections, and those will allow us to forecast how much of an impact they have on Earth. However, the idea and this is one of the things that we're pursuing through the Navy, is being able to forecast these things not one, two, or three hours in advance, but one to two days wow. in advance when these things first emerge from the sun. Because it takes, uh, depending on their speed, one to three days for them to reach Earth on average. So when you're talking about that, that's kind of really cool how that could play into futuristic uses for space weather then too, wouldn't it? Or Indeed. You can, you know, especially a far future, you can imagine not only checking your local weather forecast for Earth or whatever planet or asteroid you're living on, um, but so too you'll have to look at the space weather forecast to know whether or not you can receive cargo or send cargo to other planets or uh, passengers, etc. So... Uh, yes, it's the, the next generation, if you will, of weather forecasting. So how is the Navy improving space weather forecasting? So one of the ways that the Navy is working towards improving forecasting is trying to move from a couple hours forecast, or again, accurate forecasting, uh, to one to two days. So we're not at that operational capacity yet, but we're striving towards that. And so the way we're doing that is using, again, these remote sensing techniques. And in particular, we use both white light methods and radio methods. So the Navy has a storied history of developing white light imagers for all sorts of missions. So LASCO, SECI, the wide field imager for Parker Solar Probe. There's a long list. So the Navy is very good at using white light to capture the effects of uh, the solar wind and space weather. Um, what this white light imaging can do, it can give you things like how much mass or how much density there is, uh, how fast, for instance, coronal mass ejections are moving, the direction and trajectory, and even their, their overall shape in space. However, what white light alone can't readily give you is the full orientation of the magnetic field. There's usually some ambiguity in that. So the Navy is working towards combining white light imaging and radio observations, because the radio can give you that magnetic field strength, that magnetic field direction, when it's combined with the power of white light imaging. So that's really one of the, the sort of forefronts of Navy research right now. It's combining those two things. Yeah, that's really cool. So how do you think it will advance in the next 15 to 20 years? Well, hopefully to providing uh, one to two day forecasts uh, before these things hit Earth and generate extreme space weather events. So like I said, we're, we're not at that capacity, at least operationally yet. So the Navy has proved the concept of this using these remote sensing techniques, this fusion of uh, white light and radio to get this information. So in 15 to 20 years, it would be, uh, in order to do this operationally, 
we would have to have advanced, basically, computer automated algorithms to uh, more quickly uh, calibrate all of this white light and radio data. Because it's not a small amount of data. Uh, we're talking, you know, on the order of, in the case especially of radio, can be hundreds of gigabytes, terabytes of data. And having a turnaround time from when these things erupt and the sun to hitting the earth a few days later, trying to analyze terabytes of data is a, is a, is a, is a hard thing to do. So we need more advanced algorithms to basically generate pipelines to analyze this data. Uh, this will entail basically machine learning to do a lot of the uh, heavy lifting analysis uh, for the magnetic field properties of these things. It would also be great to have not just a radio antenna, not just one array of radio antennas, but an entire network of radio antennas situated around the world uh, operated by DON in order to monitor space weather 24-7. And of course, why limit ourselves to the Earth? We could do this in space, yeah. too. So you could imagine, instead of a network of radio antennas on Earth, or radio interferometers even, you could imagine constellations of spacecraft uh, around the Sun or the Earth-Sun environment monitoring space weather in real time, utilizing these radio and white light techniques that we discussed here. So Jason, I would like to thank you for coming in today and talking with us about space weather. I thought it was fascinating and, and really cool. And I wish I could see more auroras, but I'm usually not where they're at. Um, but for the rest of you, I would like to welcome you to watch some more Naval Horizons uh, videos. I've learned so much from watching them and they're, they're fascinating. So hope you all enjoyed this experience as much as I did. Thank you.